morning and welcome to Worship at Lake Ridge Community Church. Uh, my name is Pastor Preston and I'm uh, pleased to be here again because we are counting down to the days that we can be together. Last week we met at the at Camp Chestermere and it was so great to see so many of you there, so many new faces, new families, and uh, and so many that I just haven't seen for months and months and months. So uh, it's exciting. It's it, we, We're cautiously super optimistic about uh, what this next season holds for us. So uh, this Sunday, next Sunday, we're going to be doing this online thing, but on September 12th, we are going to be meeting again over at uh, Our Lady of Wisdom School, where we've met for years. Uh, we're going to set up the, the gym again, and uh, we're excited. We're maybe a little nervous, uh, hoping that all the pieces will come together, uh, hoping to see uh, so many people that we know and miss and love. And so uh, lots of information you can find out about what that is going to look like and how over the next few months we're going to get back into some rhythms. But it's not always getting back into what we knew. Um, we're different. I'm different. You're different. What God is doing might be different. And so so it's going to really be a season for us to pay attention, to uh, shape a life of uh, prayerful anticipation and say, God, what are you doing in our community? What are you doing in Chestermere? What are you doing in my own heart and life and my family? What have you done? What what has grown? What have, what have we lost? There's Many big questions that we're going to be talking about over the next little while. And so, um, yeah, I'm excited. I'm excited about what God is up to. And so welcome this morning to our online service. Uh, you can take a look on the side. There's information uh, there that we're going to be posting about upcoming things like our um, uh, Rocket Derby and and that sort of stuff. Uh, and there's a place for, for, for comments. So so please take a moment there and, and uh, say, say, say hello. Uh, to us there. Hey, we're looking forward to this morning of worship and prayer, and so welcome. Thank you for joining. Hey, good morning, Lake Ridge. My name is Colin. I'm excited to worship with you this morning. Uh, we're going to sing a song called This is Amazing Grace.
the slain That worthy is the king who conquered the grave Worthy is the lamb who was slain Hey there, Lake Ridge. It's Pastor Evan here, and we're glad that you've decided to join us on the Facebook Live. Hey, I just want to remind you again to make sure to make a comment in the comment section so that we know that you're here and that you're watching this morning with us. I have several announcements for us this morning, uh, some uh, related to our replant or re reconnecting time here this fall. Uh, we're really excited to say that on September the 12th, uh, we intend to be doing live services over at Our Lady of Wisdom School, again, starting at 10.30 in the morning. And we'd love for you to join us there. Uh, if you are looking for places to get involved, looking for places to connect with people, um, just about every one of the ministries that we are hoping to get started this fall uh, needs help, needs volunteers and people to help out. So I encourage you to reach out uh, to us. Uh, if that's something that you're interested in doing, you can do that at lakeridgecommunity.com uh, in the contact us uh, section of the of the page. Hey, a few other awesome opportunities to connect. The first is if you are a kid, we have got our Rocket Derby coming up on September the 18th. And here's what you got to do. You got to build yourself a rocket. So what you do is you go on to amazon.ca or you can go to the P or to PM Hobbies in Calgary and you pick yourself up a rocket kit and you build that rocket. The key to building this rocket and having us shoot it off is that we are buying B-sized engines. So your rocket has to be suitable to shoot a B-sized engine off. And uh, we're really looking forward to that. Uh, we'll be giving away some prizes, having some fun uh, with some of those things. If you're an adult and you want to get involved in helping to volunteer, we might we might even have a few slots open for that. The cost is $5 to register per kid, and you can do that at lakeridgecommunity.com forward slash rocket derby. And uh, hopefully we're we're hoping for a sunny day like today, and, uh, and it should be an awesome, awesome time. So remember, lakeridgecommunity.com forward slash rocket derby, and you can register there. Uh, yourself your rocket and then you can order up your rocket and, uh, and get going uh, if you are a teenager and that is uh, if you are in our youth ministry program uh, or are in grades 6 to 12 you're eligible to be in that program and Eric and his team is getting ready uh, to kind of get going here this fall the first kickoff event is September the 14th at 6 p.m. over at Camp Chestermere and it's gonna be a kind of a water day a water night and they're gonna bring out the power tubes you can swim, boating, canoeing, all those kind of fun things. Life jackets are provided and they're there, but we really do need you to sign up. So I'd love, love for you to go to lakeridgecommunity.com forward slash youth. And one of the main reasons is there's a waiver form on there that needs to be filled out. All students attending all youth events this year need to have a waiver form filled out at the beginning of the year for, for them to be in attendance at our thing. So I encourage you to, uh, to jump in and, and do that. If you're a parent of a teenager, then September 12th would be a great morning for you to come to church. Uh, on September the 12th, uh, Eric uh, is going to be doing kind of a parents meeting 
um, at, at Lake Ridge after the service and would just love for you to join in and you can get a little glimpse into kind of what Eric and his team have been dreaming about, praying about, and kind of how they're planning to structure this year's youth event. Hey, uh, if you have been giving to Lake Ridge uh, over this past year or even thinking about giving here in the future, I just want to say we are so grateful for your generosity. One of our values at Lake Ridge is generosity. And, and, and where some of that connects to, to, to the monetary giving, uh, really, uh, it really represents the condition of our heart. And that is that we call all people, we believe God calls all of us to live with generous hearts. Whether that is the way in which we dish out grace, whether that is the way we dish out our time, our talents, and also our, our gift, our, our money. So just invite you to consider uh, continuing to be generous towards Lake Ridge so that we can continue to use those resources to do what we believe God has called us to do in this community and in our world. Hey, I'm looking forward to this fall and, uh, and there are lots of opportunities uh, to contribute, to be a part of what's happening. If you want to give a financial gift, you can do that via an uh, e-transfer at giving at lakeridgecommunity.com or you can go to our giving site or page at lakeridgecommunity.com forward slash giving and it'll give you the link to that email but also Canada Helps and other ways that you can you can give. This fall we are looking uh, forward to seeing what God is going to be doing in our midst and among us. I really would encourage you uh, to come out and to join us and or to join us online. Be a part of what God is doing in this place as we kind of listen to each other, as we listen to this community, and we seek out ways that we can put hands and feet to the love of God. Again, uh, we're glad that you joined us this morning. Have a great week. Good morning, Lake Ridge. 2 Corinthians 12, 9 and 10. But he said to me, my grace is sufficient for you, and my power is made perfect in weakness. Therefore, I will boast all the more gladly about my weaknesses, so that Christ's power may rest on me. That is why, for Christ's sake, I delight in weaknesses, in insults, in hardships, in persecutions, and in difficulties. For when I am weak, then I am strong. Well, good morning and welcome to our time and our message this morning. Let me pray for us before we, we begin. Heavenly Father, thank you for this morning, for your love and your grace and the mercy that you show us that uh, we are loved, beloved, and in your care. Thank you for the amazing gift of your son Jesus and for the work of the Holy Spirit in our lives today. We trust you and we ask you to continue to work in us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Hey, we have been continuing on a sermon series uh, on the Beatitudes, which is the these uh, sayings of Jesus that open up his Sermon on the Mount, specifically the Sermon on the Mount uh, captured in Matthew chapter 5. And so there's, uh, there's, there's these really interesting sayings, blessed are those who are merciful, uh, blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness. And we've been working through them as a way, and this idea of being blessed are those, uh, Another word that can be used is happy are those, or right on are those who uh, who experience this or who live into this particular kind of way. And these are really paradoxes, and we've been exploring this over the series. Well, this is our last in the series, and uh, this is an interesting one that we're going to be taking a look at today. And it's all about blessed are the persecuted. It's very strange. So we're going to dive in and take a look at this today. Hey, there's uh, a lot of stories of persecution in church history, and it's a really weird thing to talk about persecution. It's not it's not something that that we step into very often. I'm in a I'm in the guest room of my house. No one's tried to take my home away from me because of who I am or what I believe. Uh, very few people that I know in this town have been per persecuted uh, for following Jesus, and so it's something that feels distant to us. But it's not distant to the history of Christianity. In fact, persecution is something that has shaped Christianity and following Jesus for a long, long time. Here's some stories. A person named Perpetua, a woman, she was imprisoned in Carthage, which is modern-day Tunisia, in 203 AD for her faith. Many early Christians were persecuted for their faith. And her father went to her when she was in prison on death row and said, 
renounce your faith. Say no to Jesus so that you can come back to your family. And she did not. And she would not. So her and she had her friend, a slave named Felicity. The two of them, they both refused to deny Jesus. And they were put in the gladiator ring and killed. This is a common story in the early history of the church. So many people were killed in, this, in various parts of the Roman Empire because they would not renounce Jesus. To say Jesus was king, <laughs> to say Jesus was Lord, went in the face of the empire of Rome at that time. Throughout history, there was many people who were persecuted for their faith. William Tyndale, he is the person that translated, first translated the Bible into English. And the Catholic Church, they didn't like that. They thought the Bible should just be in, in Latin. And so uh, he was actually strangled and burned at the stake in 1536. Well, I went to Tyndale Seminary. So even the places where I studied were named after those who did something great in Jesus' name, to help other people engage scripture. And in this case, he was killed for it. He was persecuted for it. Today, there's an estimated 200 million Christians in about 60 different countries who in one way or another are denied basic human rights because of their commitment to Jesus. And, and this number still staggers me from my position here in Chestermere, but there are hundreds of thousands who are killed each year for their faith. And there's whole websites that track with these numbers and try to make sense of stories coming out of difficult parts of the world. But these numbers, they're, they're not new. Christians, they have lost property, they've lost jobs, family, even their very lives, not to mention being ridiculed and hated because of their commitment to the way and person of Jesus. The Fox's Book of Martyrs, I got my copy of the Fox's Book of Martyrs here. It was written by a person named John Fox in a time when Christians were again persecuted in the, in the 1500s. Uh, much of it was written even during the pandemic of 1563. Uh, when many people were fleeing sickness and when many were leaving the cities, John Fox, he stayed in the city. He, he actually took money that some rich people gave him and he helped the poor and he helped his neighborhood and helped the church uh, stay, uh, stay, in this, stay in the city, in the neighborhood during this very difficult time. And he felt great comfort turning to stories of those throughout church history who had suffered for their faith, who had suffered for doing good, who had suffered for following Jesus in one way or another. And he, in this pandemic, he was suffering. And so he wrote the Fox's Book of Martyrs. And eventually, they say that this book, uh, actually most Christian homes uh, in, in, in England, eventually had two Christian books, the Bible and Fox's Book of Martyrs. This book, the Fox's Book of Martyrs, it is, it is hard to read. It's sad, it's graphic, it's cruel, uh, and it shows that Christians throughout history have suffered a great deal in order to do good, in order to step into dark places and bring the hope and love of Jesus into those places. Well, we worship in our gym. We're going to start again on September 12th. Well, we worship in our gym. Uh, guess what? Right now, the Chinese government, they are ripping down churches in parts of China. And in fact, there was one church, it was torn down a few years ago, and just two weeks ago, seven of their, of their pastors were just arrested. Or uh, just, I was reading again, uh, three elderly Eritrean pastors were in the middle of the night removed from their home. Or in Afghanistan, I'm reading stories coming out of Afghanistan that Afghan Christians who are caught with the Bible app on their phone, some have been killed. And these stories aren't surprising to us coming from these places where there's so much uh, persecution of Christians happening. But when I look at these stories, in each story of persecution, we find someone who met Jesus, who was compelled by love to do Jesus things, to do right things in a world that was not. And even in the face of big threatening systems, they stood tall knowing who they are in Jesus. So dictators, mobs, religious cruelty, or war-torn lands war landscapes are places where Jesus is often found. And if you find Jesus somewhere, you're probably going to find Jesus people in those places doing Jesus things. Making things right, mending what is broken, healing what has been destroyed. And these are the places where Jesus' people go, and Jesus' people are sometimes hurt there. 
This morning we're exploring the last beatitude of Jesus and it goes like this. It says, God blesses those who are persecuted for doing right. For the kingdom of heaven is theirs. God blesses you when people mock you and persecute you and lie about you and say all sorts of evil things against you because you are my followers. Be happy about it. Be very glad for a great reward awaits you in heaven. And remember, the ancient prophets were persecuted the same way. Wow. <laughs> Did Matthew record that right? I mean, we are working through these the challenges and the paradoxes of these blessings, of these blessed are you statements, but this last one almost takes the cake. Jesus builds up to this one and says, Blessed are those who are persecuted. Blessed are you who are persecuted. Is this really, is it really possible that happiness and God's right on is found in being persecuted? To me, it sounds, it sounds awful. And I'm not the only one. Uh, professors and theologians and preachers have been wrestling with this one for a long time. Theologian Helmut Thielke wrote, What a ghastly prospect, he said. It makes one ask in all seriousness how Jesus could have gained disciples with an appeal like that. And then go on and say, rejoice and be glad. It feels almost like mockery. It's true. Imagine Jesus comes into your town and says, you know, blessed are you when you mourn, or, or you hunger and thirst for righteousness, or he's saying these things and people are tracking along, and then he ends with this one. Blessed are you when you're persecuted. You might want to say, well, I don't even know if I want to join this Jesus. It's difficult. Well, this morning we're going to explore uh, whether what Jesus says was crazy, <laughs> Uh, or whether Jesus might be getting to something even more here, and something that I think is very encouraging for us as followers of Jesus today. Well, this last blessed are you line uh, actually offers more details than any of the others before it. Uh, and it's even more specific about what Jesus is getting at. Some of the other ones, he, Jesus doesn't elaborate very much, but on this one he does, and I'm grateful for it. You see, the other Beatitudes say, blessed are those, in kind of a general third-person way. But for some reason, Jesus gets really close here. And he says, blessed are you. God blesses you when you are persecuted. Also, Jesus brings clarity that the other Beatitudes don't often get at. This is not persecution for being an obnoxious fool or being rude about your faith. It's not persecution for being a judgmental religious person or being persecuted for sticking it to those who you don't like. It's not even persecution when you don't get your own way or get what you deserve. Or, and it's not persecution, uh, actually, if you play the victim or feign martyrdom at every turn. All that picture of, mar of uh, persecution is kind of swept to one side. Persecution in this is, Jesus says it's persecution for two things, being Jesus followers and for doing right. It's strange, and it makes me wonder, could there be happiness in joining Jesus even at the cost of being ridiculed? Could there be happiness in drawing close to what Jesus draws close to even at the cost of losing something personally? Even our very lives? Could it be, could Jesus be that good? that persecution would be worth it? This is the heart of what Jesus is getting at. Could the way of Jesus be that truly wonderful that we would serve Jesus even when it gets very expensive for us? So Jesus' Sermon on the Mount, it gets to this point and says resoundingly, yes, the happiness you are looking for is found in Jesus even at the cost of something as horrific and terrible as persecution. Jesus is setting the tone for how potent the curious happiness of Jesus is for those who follow Jesus. That no matter what comes out Jesus' followers, they will discover life in Jesus and life abundant and even be glad about it. So Jesus then even does something more. He puts himself in the middle of this sermon. It's a, it's a shift actually. The sermon in Matthew 5 now becomes a sermon about a person giving the sermon. He's giving the sermon and then he injects himself into it. Jesus, he's saying essentially that when you step into the light of relationship with Jesus, people will say evil things against you. So following Jesus, it results in persecution, but it's not Jesus that causes this sorrow. It's the evil that Jesus reveals in the world. 
that rears up in ugly ways against those who might be revealing it. Against those who love this world like Jesus did. So to make sense of this, we need to look at how Jesus is actually the center of confronting evil in the world. And what he does uh, with insults that come his way. Luckily, we have these four Gospels in the Bible that unpacks the way that Jesus confronted gross and evil and disgusting, destroying, life-sucking things in the world that he encountered. And he stepped in and he showed us how to go about doing it, how to bring life. So I'm just going to point out some. This isn't, this isn't the, the big picture, but it's some. The, the ways that Jesus stepped in with his life, with his words, with his purpose. And he was persecuted for it. He eventually died on a cross for it. Insults were hurled at him. But, but it's taking a look at what he did helps us understand maybe what we can do. So first, Jesus shows us that the world experiences making things right as either a blessing or a threat. When he stepped into something, the people around him saw Jesus as either a blessing or a threat. Just by being in the room, his righteousness, his making right relatedness happen, caused some to run and hug him. <laughs> Even sinners, they ran over knowing that his goodness and love would free them. A woman, she encountered the goodness of Jesus and she had so much guilt, but she came to Jesus and she poured perfume on him. Her tears, the Bible says, uh, poured over his feet and she used her, her, her hair and a towel to wash his feet. This is what love and right relationship, uh, what his love and right making relationship presence did in her is it freed her. That's what goodness does. But to others who were rotten with cruelty, they were exposed in the light of this goodness and they responded not with this act of love and response to Jesus, but they act with anger and bitterness and rage. Goodness does this sometimes. And exposure can either heal or threaten. When we follow Jesus into this world, we are going to step in. And our act of goodness, our act of healing, our act of love, or even our acts of mercy, they might be met as either a blessing or a threat. Secondly, Jesus' kingdom is not like the world's kingdom. Mortimer Arias says, The coming of the kingdom means a permanent confrontation of worlds. The kingdom is a question mark in the midst of established ideas and answers developed by people and societies. In other words, as long as we are following Jesus, we proclaim another way. <laughs> we become citizens of a kingdom that is subver subverting many of the ways that we have established as the right way forward here. So to liberals or conservative kingdoms, to either groups, whatever spectrum we're finding ourselves on, whatever kingdom and way of life is establishing itself and asserting itself around us, the kingdom of God will be a constant question mark in their midst. It will constantly be pushing it and saying, there is another kingdom that might even be better than the kingdom that you might be uh, a, uh, a citizen of. So as citizens of the kingdom of God, we are always going to confront and say something different than what might be the regular norm around us. Third, Jesus, he stepped over rules to get to people and show them love. He broke Sabbath laws and, uh, and healed people on the Sabbath when the rules said you shouldn't. He pointed out hypocrisy in religious leaders when he dare not do that. He upended, he upended hierarchies. He was supposed to be the Messiah, the King of Kings, and he came and he be as the servant to all. Jesus turned stuff around, and this is threatening. But he did so in order to reach those that God loves, to seek and to save, like a shepherd finding a lost sheep. Fourth, Jesus loved his enemies. This is how Jesus did good, and it's surprising. Uh, those that disagreed with him, he loved them. He met a Pharisee in the middle of the night. He called bad people to even join his team and join his inner circle. He, he allowed a betraying guy to be on his team. He forgave criminals even at death on a cross. 
And even those who were killing him, he said, God, forgive them. Jesus loved his enemies. This is how he brought goodness into the world. This is how he made things right. And he was killed for it. Fifth, Jesus made the story particularly about him. He is the way. He is the truth. He is the life. In a world that offers a whole lot of ways, you can try to be happy by getting uh, a lot of stuff. You can be trying to be happy by being really powerful. There's a lot of different ways that we can seek happiness, but Jesus puts himself at the center of the equation for how we get along in this life. He's saying that he is the way. His way makes sense of philosophy and psychology and economics and family and religion and politics. His life, his very person, makes sense of it all. He is the way. And in all areas, uh, it is his life that makes all things right again. And it's a radical claim that us as followers of Jesus make. But we make it because Jesus made it. And we say Jesus is the way. And lastly, Jesus, he gave his life. He was persecuted and he rose again to conquer death. And this is wonderful and it's mysterious. And the whole Bible is just committed to trying to make sense and unpack what Jesus' death and life uh, means for us. But one thing we do know is that the finality of death is not the end. But we have hope in the joy of resurrection. Today we live with this resurrection hope of Jesus that death is not the end. That we live in him. The way of Jesus, it ends in life. The way of Jesus ends in making all things new, in all relationships, for all people. And this is good news. He's in the business of making all things new. And we live with this hope. And so we know how the story ends. And so we can step into places that might hurt because we know where this is going. So the curious happiness of Jesus leads us along a path of persecution. When the light of Jesus, it shines in a dark place, uh, darkness cannot handle it. Kind of like turning on a light and, and things scatter in the light of it all. And things that are exposed by the light of Jesus, they might hurt us. They might lash out at us. But they do not overcome us. Because Jesus says he has us covered. So we live in a place and time that we're not regularly persecuted. As I mentioned before, I'm in a pretty safe home. I don't have a big fence around my house. I can worship in, in open. I can worship publicly. We can meet in a gymnasium. We can talk about our faith. And people might have questions about it. People might, might push back in some ways. But we're not a persecuted people. So this is a gift and it's a privilege for us. You see, millions of followers of Jesus in history and even today around the world, they uh, do not um, uh, they do not suffer or... They suffer persecution and we do not. We do not have to contend with the last beatitude in the same way that so many other people do. So in this place of safety, we can wrestle with the big questions of how we follow Jesus and do right and good. Are we healing what's broken here in Chestermere? Are we stepping into dark places with the light of Jesus? Knowing that, yeah, something might cost us. We might lose something in this. Did you know that being part of Lake Ridge Community Church costs us something? It costs us time. It costs us our resources. It costs us our, our, the ache of loving people who are different than us. It's a costly thing. And it is because we are people who step in to a dark world uh, with goodness and hope, even if it costs us. Do we trust that in Jesus? And do we believe that his kingdom is making the world right again? Do we believe that the kingdom of Jesus is different and contends with and pushes often against other kingdoms that want to usurp the lordship of Jesus and the work Jesus is doing to make all things right and good again? Is our happiness found in joining with Jesus and doing Jesus things here and now? Or do we think our happiness is found elsewhere? These are big questions that we can ask in this time of relative peace and safety here in our homes. So the curious of happiness of Jesus, it is for you. Found woven in humility, purity of heart, working for peace and justice, poverty and mercy, even in persecution. The curious happiness of Jesus is for you. It's here that we're called 
And here that we find God saying, right on, you found it. I'm glad for you. Blessed are you. Yes, yes, yes. You found happiness. You will not be disappointed in joining me. In fact, you'll be glad and very glad you did. Friends, I don't think we find happiness uh, as a church uh, with the best preachers. I don't think we're going to find happiness with the best building, with the best programs and the best music. That's not where we're going to find happiness as Lake Ridge Community Church and as followers of Jesus. No, we are going to find happiness in joining Jesus, in loving our city in the way that Jesus loves our city. We might get slivers along the way. We might get bruised along the way. And it might cost us something now and then. But I hope that we find in Jesus' Sermon on the Mount a life of joy that goes straight into the life we share with Christ now. So friends, I hope that you will take and maybe step back into the opening few verses of Matthew 5. Maybe read, read them again today if you have a chance. And read it all in light of the ways that God is inviting you into relationship with him. To step into the dark and scary places of this world, knowing that he's got you covered. <laughs> knowing that he's embracing you. Knowing that he's gone there first. And knowing that life in Jesus is so worth it. That no matter what loss we might suffer in following Jesus, when we participate with Jesus in the hard stuff of life, that Jesus always meets us there with this resurrection hope. Friends, I love you, and I know that this last season of the pandemic has been difficult. But I also know that the curious happiness of Jesus is sometimes found in the difficult places. Because it's in these places that we meet Jesus himself. And he is here. So may the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. May the Lord lift up his countenance upon you and grant you his peace. As you go from here today. Amen. Amen. Hey, reach out if you want to chat about anything we've talked about here today. And uh, look forward, please, uh, look forward to having you join us on the 12th. If you are able, uh, we're just really excited to be together again. So bless you and have a great week.